A few nights ago, I had an experience that, while being a pretty first world problem, is something that I'm sure at least some of you listening to this will relate to. I had a dream that I was in Japan. I've been to Japan three different times now, and it remains one of my favorite places on Earth. Yes, I uh, am a weeaboo. How could you tell? I love Japan. I love the culture, I love the food, and most of all, I love that it is not where I live and work. So, needless to say, it's always quite the depressing transition when one moment you're reliving an experience that you're financially locked out of having for most of your life, and the next you hear your alarm going off and you realize that you need to put on clothes and start getting ready to head into work to sell the next few hours of your life for the privilege of having a roof over your head and food on your table for another few weeks. All of this is to say that, for a lot of us, being a working adult can be an exhausting, physically and mentally draining experience, and we tend to cherish the moments where we can escape that experience for even just a little while. As long as travel remains a financially restrictive prospect for anybody who wants to go anywhere further than the next town over, it's not an experience that I'm sure many of us get to have as often as we'd like. And that sentiment isn't something I had expected to be on my mind as a result of watching a stop-motion show about multicolored animal monsters. But here we are. When Pokémon Concierge was first revealed in the February 2023 Pokémon Presents livestream, it was probably the reveal that inspired the weakest reaction from me. I've never been a fan of stop-motion animation, and with the singular exception of The Nightmare Before Christmas, every stop-motion feature I've actually enjoyed was in spite of its animation and not because of it. So, it was a bit of a surprise to myself that a few weeks ago, while browsing Netflix for something to put on, that I, against every voice in my head screaming at me not to, decided to load up the first episode. It probably helps that my choices were between that and trying to continue pushing through the live-action Yu Yu Hakusho adaptation, and frankly I'd be hard-pressed to think of any work that wouldn't seem like a more favorable option in that situation with the exception of something along the lines of Solo or a Serbian film. And so it was with some hesitance that I went ahead and decided to give the show at least a single episode to see if it could manage to hook me. And as it turns out, yes. Yes it could. And in order to explain why it hooked me, I'm gonna need to take a little bit of a tangent. You see, for a lot of people who grew up with Pokémon and have continued to love it throughout their lives, I feel like there's always at least a small phase where we want Pokémon to be more... grown up. What this means is different for every Pokémon fan, and when we're teenagers it often comes with a desire to have the characters face up to the more darker consequences and situations that are more implied by the games in the earlier generations, but never felt fully realized in the main anime. It's no surprise, then, that so many Pokémon fans would tend to cite the Generations miniseries from 2016 as one of their favorite pieces of non-game Pokémon media. As hard as it was to watch that early tussle between Charmander and Squirtle when it was treated with all the gravitas that a magical dogfight actually would be, so many of us finally felt seen by the Pokémon Company, as if it were talking to us as adults for the first time. And while I do still have a love for the Generations shorts and to this day place them amongst some of my favorite non-game Pokémon stories, I do have to look back and laugh at least a little bit because now that I unquestionably am an adult, at least to the degree that my wife and I aren't allowed to go near a Chuck E. Cheese without either borrowing my sister's daughter or contributing to the overpopulation problem ourselves, stories that deal with the dark and gritty aren't necessarily what I consider the true hallmark of an adult story at this point in my life. There is a genre of anime called iyashi k or healing anime as it tends to get translated, shows that rather than being bombastic action pieces like your Kill la Kill or exercises in drama and characterization like Rakugo Shinju, rather focus on delivering a calmer, low-stakes slice-of-life experience. Something like Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, wherein the protagonist is a working adult who knows how exhausting it can be to be a part of the system, and just tries to find joy in the little things, like family, friendship, and being thirsted over by a busty dragon from another world. At this point in my life, that is the kind of show that tends to appeal to me more often than not, and it's because these are the stories that more than any other tend to make me feel like I'm being seen as an adult. Not because I'm some supposed paragon of maturity, but instead because they understand that adult life, for all of its benefits, can be an exhausting experience, and sometimes more than anything else, what I want as an adult is just for someone to recognize what I've been through, tell me that they've been there too, and 
remind me that I'm more than my struggles. And that is what Pokemon Concierge was able to offer me. Over the course of four short episodes that don't even add up to being the total length of your average movie, this show welcomed me to a tropical paradise where the struggles I felt in my daily life felt a million miles away, if only for a little while. Pokemon Concierge's story follows a woman named Haru. Haru is, like so many of the people who grew up with Pokemon in its earliest days, someone who has now spent enough time in the adult world that the grind of the 40-hour-a-week office worker lifestyle has completely reshaped her state of mind and how she sees the world. The series begins when a string of everyday struggles piles up to the point where Haru does what I'm sure many of us have at least considered before. She quits her job, leaves home, and pursues a more fulfilling path. At first, the transition is difficult for her. When her new boss, Miss Watanabe, tells her that she needs to spend the first day just acclimating and relaxing, Haru finds it difficult to do so, likely because her previous job left her feeling like time spent relaxing was time stolen. When she shows Miss Watanabe her report on her first day's activities and Miss Watanabe tells Haru that making a detailed report isn't what she had asked her to do, Haru's first instinct is to panic and assume she's in trouble with her supervisor. And as somebody who has spent plenty of time working under unreasonable superiors who tend to make a habit of belittling their charges as if they almost get a sort of sadistic pleasure out of it, it hits all too close to home for me. When I looked at Haru, I saw my own experiences reflected back at me. And when Miss Watanabe lets Haru know that it's not just okay, but necessary to slow down and enjoy herself instead of focusing on being a productive worker, I saw the kind of caring mentor figure that I feel like so many of us don't really get to have once we're thrust into the working world and are expected to be self-sufficient. Miss Watanabe feels like a walking thesis statement for the show, a warm, matronly figure who just wants others to feel calm, welcomed, and at peace with themselves. Those who know me know that I joke around a lot about my obsession with anime moms because, frankly, anime moms are one of the greatest things in life. But when I say that Miss Watanabe has big mom energy, I mean it in a completely different way than I would when I'm talking about my favorite Nikkei characters. Instead, this is the kind of energy that just feels like getting a big hug from someone who's been around the block sees you struggling and making that journey yourself, and instead of telling you to suck it up and act like an adult, will instead just sit down with you and listen to you while you pour your heart out to them. And all of this isn't to say that the adult life is constantly miserable and that we should all just give up. There's a moment in the show where Haru spends time with the Psyduck that she's been caring for and reflects that When I was a little kid, it was my dream to eat as much candy as I wanted the minute I grew up. It's nice how much freedom adults have. Getting away from it all reminds Haru that for all the soul-grinding fatigue that the adult world can inflict on us, it's important to not lose sight of who we are and what brings us happiness, even if that's something as simple as just enjoying as much candy as you want. And that's what I mean when I say that Pokemon Concierge feels like a Pokemon story written for adults because the show understands that a significant amount of the people watching it are the ones who grew up watching Pokemon on Saturday mornings with a big spoonful of sugary cereal in one hand and a Game Boy in the other. And the show knows that no matter how old we get, we are still just those same children faking what it means to be grown up to varying degrees of success. So when I see Haru get to stop having to be an adult and instead just go back to being that same Pokemon-loving child whose biggest concern was what would be for dinner that night, it made me feel like I was also being transported back to those same days, wiping a booger from my nose while realizing that I had gotten my Pokemon Blue cartridge mixed up with a friend's because my party certainly wasn't headed up by a Pidgey named Shit. The strength of Pokemon Concierge lies in its commitment to creating an experience that soothes the soul of the tired Pokemon fan, taking them back to that same colorful world full of wonder and joy, where nobody has to think about things like making enough to afford both rent and gas without having to live on ramen for a few days. And that world is brought to life through visuals that understand the feeling that the show is trying to impart. I mentioned at the top of the video that almost no stop-motion feature has ever managed to make me enjoy it for its art style, but I'm shocked to say that Pokemon Concierge is one of the only ones to ever actually not only make me like it for its visuals, but frankly to have me count them as one of its greatest strengths. 
Most people who have spent any portion of their life collecting Pokemon trading cards is going to be familiar with the works of Asaka Ito and Yuka Mori, the creators of the crochet and clay-based card artworks that have been a mainstay of the game for so long now. And watching Pokemon Concierge feels like getting to live in the world that these cards are snapshots of. From the fuzzy furrets to the sleeker look of Metagross and Graveler, the show's handcrafted look gives the viewer a feeling that they could just reach through their TV screen and touch the world that they're viewing right now. And much in the way that the colorful, handcrafted Pokémon and environments contribute to creating the tropical paradise of the Pokémon Resort, the ending theme, Have a Good Time Here by Maria Motherfucking Takeuchi, reinforces the idea that the show acts as a gateway for the viewer to a place where they can just get away from it all, if only for a short while. This beautiful and lively city pop track caps off each episode with the lines, Welcome to the place where you can be yourself. Just try to have fun. That's all you should do. And that's all I want to do. Pokemon Concierge helped me by letting me be myself and have fun. It reminded me that even though I am an adult, I don't have to let my career control how I view my life. I don't have to be what my W2 says that I am. Instead, I can just be me. I already know that the Japan dream that I mentioned at the beginning of this video is not going to be the last one I ever have. When my conscious mind gets too bogged down by the thought of having to wake up and go to work in the morning, I'm sure my subconscious will do its best to take me back to a place that my wallet normally keeps out of my reach. But during those waking hours, it's comforting to know that there's a way that, even for just a little bit, I can take a trip back to a place where I can just be myself. And I know that even if it never gets another season, there will be many return trips to the Pokemon Resort in my future. But for now, this is where we say our goodbyes. So I'll see you next time, and just remember that this has been a powerfully pointless video, but I hope you enjoyed it anyways. Alright. Uh, so it's kind of funny that after my last video was definitely more jokey and silly that this one got a bit more sincere. Uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to talk about at first in regards to Pokemon Concierge, but after even just watching the first episode, I knew it was something I did need to talk about. And as I started writing the script for this video... I guess my hands just decided on their own what they were going to be typing, and before I knew it, the script became what it was. Uh, I actually have a bunch of notes about the show that pretty much just didn't make it in uh, at, at all. Things about just, you know, certain scenes that I do love, uh, what I thought about the side characters. Short version is I, I love all of them. They're a lot of fun. And... Yeah, no, but, I mean, I, I guess the point I wanted to get across more than anything is just that... Pokemon Concierge is a great show uh, that I was not expecting to love as much as I did, and that if you have enjoyed Pokemon at any point in your life, I really think it is worth just stopping and sitting down for, I don't even think it's for two full hours, just, just give it a watch, yeah. So, uh, that's really all I have to say, other than I can't believe my last video uh, over Lorcana is up to over 900 views at the time of recording this. It, the views seem to have slowed down, uh, so it'd be cool if I could reach a thousand views on that, because that'd be the most crazy uh, that I've gotten on this channel since the Common Rider video from way back when. Uh, but even if they don't, I'm, I'm still very pleased with how that panned out, and I want to thank everybody who watched it and everybody who subscribed as a result. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, in the meantime, uh, this has once again been powerfully pointless, and I will see you next time.